Hi there, listeners. Welcome to the new episode of The Whole Box. I said I'd be back. I said I'd be back this year. And uh, this is something that I've had in the back burner for a little while. Um, actually had a little plan to try and do it last winter. But here we are, 2024. And uh, the subject matter that we're going to talk about is, well, in simple terms, it's joint injections. But really, it's sort of having a look at that, you know, a little bit of the culture of keeping keeping competition horses on the road, you know, which, particularly in the eventing world. Um, but also just about what that is, what that means, what we can do. Uh, a lot of the modern treatments out there, they're out there and available now. And I have got an old friend back on, absolute fan of eventing, absolute legend, been to God knows how many championships and Olympics and five stars around the world. Chris Elliott, who joins us from sunny Wellington. How are you, Chris? Good, thanks, Spike. Yes, it is sunny. I'm just looking at the, Yes, it is still sunny. I confirmed that it is Florida. It is sunny. It is warm. It is tropical. It is lovely. Yeah, how's life treating you out there? You're work, yeah. working for a big practice in, in Florida, treating lots of horses. Yeah, based here in Wellington in a big uh, veterinary practice, Palm Beach Equine Clinic. Uh, we got 30 sport horse veterinarians doing um, all things in terms of hospital and on the road. I'm based on the road, uh, ambulatory sports medicine and rehabilitation. Um, yeah, having a great time. We're here in the middle of our uh, winter equestrian festival, so 12 straight weeks of elite level show jumping and dressage. Um, it's hectic. Um, horses everywhere you look and uh, certainly lots of joint injections everywhere you look. <laughs> yes. Yeah, we'll get on to that. We'll get on to that about the, you know, so the, the sort of slightly different approaches you get as you, you know, in different uh, jurisdictions, different countries um, and things like that. But uh, thank you for joining. Really excited about doing this. And listeners, if you've got any questions as a result of it, please get in touch. Um, I think it's it'll feel a little bit like we're just sort of scratching the surface on the topic at times, but we'll try and dig deep. We'll try and pull out some, in, you know, some interesting info for people. Um, and yeah, hopefully just get a few people thinking about slightly sometimes and maybe a slightly different approach to things so chris i really simply wanted to talk you know i've titled this joint injections but i suppose the first thing we probably need to explain to people and what we can talk about is what we would see as what we call joint disease as such so what you know what are we treating as as a starting point you know are we you know so let's say we're talking about the you know a horse that goes lame how first off how's the vet going to work out that it is a particular joint that the problem is um, but after that, we'll go on to sort of what, you know, what that then means. When we're thinking about joint disease and we're, we're thinking about, uh, you know, orthopedic causes of lameness, um, first of all, your veterinarian, like us, we, we're going to do a, a comprehensive, thorough lameness examination or ortho, orthopedic examination or, or potentially thinking about that maybe as a performance examination. So, you know, we have joint disease as a cause of lameness, all the way as a continuum from significant joint disease causing obvious and overt lameness, all the way down to potentially mild and moderate joint disease that is causing potentially poor performance. So trying to narrow down our location involves uh, palpation, uh, examination in hand, sometimes examination under saddle, um, and then things like flexion tests, um, discussing with our riders what type of issues we've been seeing. Um, and then if we're seeing an overt lameness, utilising our diagnostic analgesia, so nerve blocks, to try and localise exactly where our pain is and then trying to bring that down a little bit closer into what area of the leg, particularly what joint we might be talking about, and then thinking about our diagnostic imaging x-rays ultrasounds and maybe some more advanced diagnostic imaging to work out we've got a joint um, there's lots of parts to that joint soft tissue as well as bone um, we've got soft tissue around joints we've got soft tissue within that synovium the joint capsule then we've got the bone we've got the subchondral bone that's the bone directly below the cartilage that's really important to think about and then we've got the cartilage and then we've got the synovial fluid and all of those things are all involved in what we call uh, joint disease. Sometimes nice to think about it as degenerative joint disease, DJD, um, as all of us 
are aware as we get older, our joints become more sore, same as our equine athletes. Um, and some of them are a chronic repetitive uh, strain type injury. Some of them are a more acute injury on top of a chronic process. But um, the complexity of joint disease is, is there from a multitude of different levels and different severity. Yeah, you, you definitely touched on, on it there a little bit about, you know, finding as close or a two or if you know hopefully a very exact diagnosis being so important you know the use of ultrasound x-ray things like mri or ct scanning can be useful as well you know yes it's a more expensive approach but it can very much lead to you know what we're going to go on and talk to you about later about a, a very much a targeted approach to what we're trying to achieve with any treatments or any injections that we're talking about here my real approach there would be you know trying to get an exact diagnosis, you know, A, what is joint affected? And then B, what do we think is actually going on in that joint as best we can? Because actually there's some cases, for example, you can get bone chips in joints. They can be developmental in young horses where actually joint injections are completely probably not the way forward. You know, these become cases where, where you know, keyhole surgery is the way forward, you know, and referral for surgery. So, um yeah, that 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 working out what we're talking about as joint disease and what's causing the disease and what the problem actually is, yeah. I think is always the first step, isn't it? I th- I think for riders and owners and 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 clients of of us as as veterinarians, the the money that is spent in in accurate and correct diagnosis is always going to be good investment. It's better to spend our money in accurate investigations and accurate diagnosis as opposed to spending our money on treatments that are not targeted yeah very much so but you can have a you know you can have a stepwise approach can't you chris Absolutely. You know, just mentioning there you know sometimes a you know an obviously lame horse that you can do that you know those diagnostic approach to with the nerve blocking or the joint blocking you know the low grade performance limitation that you can Absolutely. sometimes have you know they can be really tricky things you know and, and yeah. actually going down the line of a sort of a as a treatment option to see what the response to treatment is is actually quite yeah. a common approach to the sports horse isn't it you know yeah. that's a- and and that's where the the experienced veterinarian within the within the sport understands common things happen commonly balance of probabilities it's likely yeah. that this is our location of our cause of our performance limitation our soreness our lameness so let's do our you know educated treatment option um let's see how this horse responds to that if our horse responds well to it great um if our horse doesn't fully respond to that then sometimes going down that diagnostic pathway can be really helpful but you're absolutely right sometimes the um concept of the trial treatment can can be really quite nice particularly when we understand what the horse is doing where it's in its um, education and training and kind of what our goals are in the short and long term for this horse. Common things happen commonly. Yeah, and it's funny, I, I think back to when I was a vet student and we, we kind of got told that you weren't allowed to sort of pattern recognise, you know, you had to have this very yeah. systemic yeah, approach to problems. Yeah. Um, pattern recognition. Whereas I now find myself doing a lot of pattern recognition. Yeah. Um, I mean, it probably means I'm old and I've seen – a lot of yeah. patterns i suppose yeah, but, uh, yeah that is difficult isn't it as you say you know with time and experience you can develop your understanding of you know what you know common things are common but how do they present and that can yeah. be a, you know a, a, a you know a sensible approach but equally there's sometimes there isn't anything wrong with going i want you know i actually want to have a systemic approach to this and systematic approach sorry um so yeah different you know different ways of approaching it and i think that performance management stuff. Now, we listeners, we've spoken about this in the past and dig out some of the older whole box stuff that we did with, I think we did a physio one and a, and a farrier one and things like that. But when we're talking about performance management, Chris, and let's try and stick to probably our eventers, what, yeah. what, if I said we're performance managing event horses, what, what does that sort of mean to you as a sort of a bit of a summary? So for me, I feel like it's creating that solid relationship between the whole support team the rider, the groom, the veterinarian, and our other complementary therapists, physios, uh, farriers, um, so that we all understand this horse intimately. We know how it moves. We know what's normal for this horse and maybe what's slightly off. Um, performance management is in setting goals. 
what we're trying to achieve, where we're trying to get to, because um, we need to, we as veterinarians need to understand where, what you're trying to get to, what your short-term goals and what your long-term goals are. Because if we sacrifice a long-term goal to achieve a short-term goal, sometimes that's less than ideal. But performance management knows what the horse is currently doing, what it wants to do, um, and where we're all trying to get to. But that close relationship between the veterinarian and the rider and the groom and the horse knowing exactly how that horse moves and regularly monitoring it um, before and after competitions beginning of the season middle of the season and end of season um, is how I think about performance management and then optimizing performance knowing sometimes the small ailments that are in these horses how best to support them through its athletic career you know these horses all have little things that aren't quite perfect because they're elite level athletes and they're doing the job. Um, we got to support them and make sure that they continue doing their job. We can't forget that these are, these are horses. These are, you know, an, an animal and they are, they all vary with their approach and how they, you know, do they want to, you know, how they want to be trained and how much they want to do it. And, and one of the things that's that's sort of a bit of a, you know, when you speak to, you know, we speak to our five-star riders and we talk about their five-star horses. But, I mean, ultimately, the horses that are getting to that level of competition are just so brave and have probably a pretty high level of of managing. And I hate to use the word pain because that's really anthropomorphizing it. But, they, you know, training is, you know, they can get sore. You know, you look at elite athletes in, in you know, in football or rugby or whatever sport we're looking at. Um and you can find sometimes you can be looking, you have these cases where, can't you, Chris, you've been, you look for ages to find that subtle little niggle or whatever it is. And you've got a horse presenting, just not wanting to do it. It's rearing or it's doing this or it's doing that. Planting just doesn't want to do the job. Yeah. And then you can get, you get asked to go and look at a horse that's been performing at a high level. And the rider goes, oh, it's always been a bit like that. And you're like, well, it's a bit lame. Like, it's really lame. How's it? And, it, and it's been doing it for however long and they just and that's that natural variation and that's why i think as vets we always need to be really respectful of the horse and respectful of what they're able to do um, yeah. but also um that natural variation in her, in that clinical presentation of the cases so yeah i think i think that was a really good summary chris of what you know that that performance management i i do look at it a little bit as well as looking at sort of injury prevention as well yeah you know i think you know you've got those horses and we all know them that you know roll you know just drag drag themselves along in front they you know loading their yeah. front ends um, if they're un- if they're uncomfortable behind they overload in front and then when they overload in front they're going to be causing themselves an injury in front so you actually need to prevent the injury in front by making sure their rear end is as perfectly comfortable as possible and the yeah. thing that connects the rear to the front is their back and their si yeah so and then it's remembering that there's a horse attached to whatever single problem there is so yeah We've talked about this before on other podcast guys, go out and dig them out. Um, we, the one I think I did with Emma Dainty, the physio, was was very good. And we talked about that sort of whole horse approach to problems. Um, right, Chris, joints. Let's get back right. on the subject. We could, Me and you could just banter around about all that stuff for ages. Yeah. Um, so we talked a little bit about those different presentations, and they vary from yeah. a horse that's going acutely lame, as we call it, yeah. or a horse that's got a chronic problem, which means it's been going on for a longer period of time. Um, but... You've touched on it a little bit, but what are we what are we looking to achieve from our treatments? So our joint disease, whatever our cause, the fundamental reason why the horse is painful in my mind is because we have inflammation. We have an inflamed joint uh, on its most simplest thought process. We have inflammation. Inflammation causes pain. Now, inflammation is also causing increased synovial fluid. You know, the, the puffy joint, that's, that's painful when we have a fusion there. We have inflammation, inflammatory proteins, inflammatory markers within that joint that are creating pain. And so our fundamental overriding principle is to control inflammation. When we control inflammation, we control pain. When we control pain, we then return the horse from being asymmetrical and lame uh, to being less asymmetrical and hopefully sound in terms of free of pain fundamentally it's about controlling inflammation okay and so that's looking at it of managing the inflammation and managing the pain what about the other side of what we might be doing with our with our joint medications you know we we can take away the pain and there's we'll talk about the various ways we can do that but what about altering 
what's happening within that joint. So let's say we've, you know, with our advanced diagnostics or good x-rays, good scans, we've, we've diagnosed, let's say, a soft tissue problem. Let's say the, the joint capsule, as you say, which has got the synovium has been a bit injured. Um, rather than just managing pain and inflammation, what else are we going to be achieving from what we're, you know, from our treatment here? So trying to use our joint medications to be uh, promoting a healing process. So we control, you know, we can try and promote that healing process by promoting a, an anabolic process as opposed to a catabolic process. So a building process as opposed to a degradating process. So um, using our our joint medications and our joint therapies to be promoting a, a healing reparative process and then potentially trying to modify the way this joint is going in terms of instead of it being a negative cycle, um, continued exercise, creating more degradation, we're going to try and reverse that cycle to try and promote a, a healing and, and building process. And that links back to what you were saying before about getting a really important history and background on on the horse and your and the clients about what the sort of short term and long term goals are, as well as the age and, and level that the horse is competing at. So I think you said already, you know, you don't want to be, you know, damaging long term goals by achieving something in the short term. And and I think that's that real balance between what we're discussing there between simply taking away the pain and having a horse back in training, as it were, versus what we're trying to achieve about modifying whatever disease process there is there, which is always going to take time, you know, yeah. however, however fancy we are with our, with our man, you know, with our treatment and rehabilitation processes, time is always something that we want to be giving horses to heal in the inverted commas. So yeah, I think that's a really important thing, you know, if you've got a horse, and, and again, it depends on the plan, you know, we might be think, trying to, you know, a horse might have sprained a fetlock three weeks before going to the Olympics. Well, the most important thing of the year is to get this horse as comfortable as possible so it can go and compete at the Olympics um, versus your five or six year old that's damaged a bit of cartilage and you want to do the best thing for it in the long term. So, so yeah, listeners, I think that's always a really important aspect to, to what you're trying to achieve with these. Performance management, understanding our short and long term and creating that team between the rider and, and the horse yeah. and the veterinarian. Yeah, very much so. Okay, grand job. So, right, let's talk about the different treatment options, Chris. We can talk about, you know, the title of this is we're doing joint injections, but are there any other things that we can do to to treat joints without having to stick a needle in it? So, yeah, I think we have our systemic medication, so medication that we're giving the whole horse, um, and that can probably be broken down into um, – our anti-inflammatory medications, um, whether they, you know, and they're typically thought of as, as our veterinary medicines, um, you know, like phenylbutazone, uh, meloxicam, our non-steroidal anti-inflammatories that are, that are using to, to control our inflammation on, on a whole body. And then we have potentially our other whole body systemic medications things that are more targeted at supporting our uh, joints, so potentially injectable systemic medications um, like uh, pentasan or hyaluronic acid that, that you're giving to the horse as a, as a whole horse-type treatment. Um, yeah, so or, sorry to jump in there. Yep. So listen, so other than we talk about different brands there, so pentasan is it's an Australian, New Zealand brand, isn't it? Pentasan, yeah. pentasan gold. Uh, listeners, you might, you know, Cartrofen would be a common Cartrofen, one. Ad yes. Adequan was one Adequan. that was available. That's, I yeah. think that's less available now. Arthropen yeah. is another one that's, that's yeah. come to prominence over here. They're all very, much, very similar. They're all pretty much the similar active ingredient. They might just be in slightly different concentrations, depending on how much bang you get for your buck, as it were. Um, and, you know, and, and Chris talking about hyanate, again, the hyaluronic acid, there's various versions of that um, that can be used as well, depending on which country you're in. So, um, yeah. but that's, it's all very popular in, uh, in Wellington, all those things. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, the FDA approved version of pentasan polysulfate, which is your active ingredient, um, is called Zycosan here in the U S and then hyaluronic acid, a, a very typical one, a, a brand name is called legend. Yeah. Um, and then Adequan is, is your number one kind of systemic joint support medication. 
Um, and then we have plenty of oral type supplements, plenty of them quite plenty, natural. Plenty of them around. <laughs> plenty of them around. Um, but in terms of looking at the evidence that supports a lot of these oral medications, at times the, the, the evidence is really lacking to support their use. Um, and I think in general, if we make a very broad summary of our um, oral joint support medications, we've gone away from the concept in medicine, human medicine, as well as, as veterinary medicine of providing more building blocks to joint health as in, oh, it's degradating these ingredients. You need to just give more of those ingredients to your horse um, or your human. Um, it doesn't quite work like that as we, as we once thought. Um, the general principles of our, um, of our oral supplements or our nutraceuticals is about providing some form of natural anti-inflammatory, natural antioxidant, natural kind of um, often plant-based ingredients that are providing a, a whole body type um, way to control those inflammatory markers that, that are there that are contributing to our um, degradation of the joint. Yeah. Um, I think we all need to be very Oh, cynical. I'm an old man. So cynic I think Cynical is very... real. That's the, yeah, I think we I should think, all be cynical. I think we should oh. just be aware of how much, you know, the, the cost of some of them and with yeah, and such the, limited the, evidence. But correct. Uh, so yeah. huge cost, limited evidence, um, very limited evidence in, in many ways. Um, I know here um, with my clients, I actually have a little thing on my phone and I break down like the, the yearly costs of all of these supplements sometimes and I just compare and contrast it for, for my clients to say, hey, look, like, yeah, that's super that you're giving that product, but, but you do know you're spending like three or four or five thousand dollars a year on that when actually we when actually we could just be spending that maybe a little better on management farrery. Uh, proactive veterinary interventions, um, that type of thing. Um, you know, you're, I always you're, think with horses, it's always a really bad idea to extrapolate to what it costs you for a year. It's just a number yeah. you never want to know. Isn't it? I know, but, um, but sometimes it's very easy to spend clients' yeah. money on things that have limited evidence. Yeah, and I think that, and, and what what we can say is that the you know the medications we talked about, the the, the pentazan, the polysulfated glycosaminoglycan, yeah. so that's the Karchfen and the so, pentazan and whatever the different versions are. They, you know, they do have published evidence and that they yeah. have an effect. They are yeah. by definition a medication, so they have to prove an effect, otherwise yeah. they aren't allowed like, to be medications. Correct, and um, and evidence to show disease modification, not just yeah. symptom modification. So that's a, a nice little kind of concept that sometimes that we'll probably talk a little bit more about when we talk about this other stuff symptom modification is taking away the the inflammation taking away the pain making the horse look better disease modification is that so a lot of these products that, that veterinarians use have somewhere along their research and development and then peer reviewed published protocols that show that they do actually modify the disease process. They slow down the degradation of cartilage. They reduce the amount of uh, fibrillation or kind of fraying of uh, cartilage edges or, or bone. Mm. They, they show some increases in improvements of radiographic changes compared to placebos. Um, you know, a lot of these medications that we have talked about and will talk about do have proper science behind them. And so I think, Clients should be willing and open-minded to discuss these things with their veterinarian about what has evidence and what has limited evidence. Yeah, no, I think that's a really good point. And, and I think the final thing I would say is when we're talking about efficacy here, I think that uh, these things have a, have a place. They're supportive. Mm -hmm. I think they're probably not so powerful to turn a you know a horse that's showing signs of lameness into signs of soundness but i think if, from the point of view of trying to support cartilage it's very effective at doing that and uh and yeah we can you know the nice thing is actually we can give um horses under fei regulations they can have a treatment of carch fennel or hyaluronic acid during during a competition um there's certain regulations about the timing of that but generally speaking um you, post cross country or the night before cross country can be a really nice time to ensure we are supporting that horse's cartilage yeah. when they're going yeah. out and doing their doing their galloping and, so and in terms of these systemic products having that 
consultation with your veterinarian, how to use them wisely and how to use them in a targeted fashion, not just giving them whenever, you know, trying to utilize these medications when they are likely to be more effective and when they are likely to give you that, um, that performance management benefit. Yeah. No, I totally, uh, I'm totally on board with all of those things. So let's talk about the treatment options that can go into joints then. And I will, I'm going to quiz you, Chris, because you're yep. my guest and I'm the boss. Uh, and I'm also going to just be a little, I'm going to just, there's some various old wives tales and there's various yes. sort of, I'm going to be. Um, there's lots of them. I'm going to, I was going to say, I'm going to sit on the fence. I'm not, I'm going to sit on the other side of the fence and I'm going to quiz you about the things that uh, I think as all vets, we all get challenged with day to day about certain things. So let's start off with, let's say we are simple terms. Something that's very commonly done is let's say medication of the lower hock joints yeah um what are you going to do to treat my horse that's got mild signs of lower hock joint arthritis yeah so hocks are your number one kind of place that we're injecting products into um particularly in our performance horse so for me my first point of call and the cornerstone of my orthopedic practice is corticosteroids triamcinolone or betamethasone um, at an appropriate dose inside those joints um, as a potent corticosteroid anti-inflammatory uh, with some evidence to say that it has at least to a certain degree some disease-modifying effects. So putting but steroids doc, inside the heart. Dr. Chris, my livery yard owner, tells me that once you've started treating horses' hocks, the effect wears off uh, really quickly. So yeah. I don't want to start doing it now. That's, I'm wait. Okay, so that that concept is very commonly um, held, and I would like to challenge that concept by saying that as all athletic horses continue through their career and as all athletic horses age, their joints continue to degrade as they get older and as they progress through their athletic career all joints degrade over a period of time now at what point do they start becoming clinically apparent and at what speed do they start degrading to a point that's all individually variable but the concept of once you start injecting a joint you have to keep injecting and you're going to have to inject it more frequently is not in my mind anything to do with the fact that you've injected it it's the fact that you've continued to compete the horse the horse has continued to become older we can't reverse time and for some horses you need to inject that joint to get them through the hurdle of that area being painful but we can then actually do lots of things to the whole horse to potentially prevent having to inject that again because maybe the reason why it's sore in one place is because actually it's sore in many other places and we can get them under control as well but my take on the concept of once you inject it you have to keep injecting it and it gets more frequently as you go on it's got nothing to do with the fact that you're injecting it. It's just the fact that the horse is continuing in, his, in their athletic career and the horse is continuing to become older and all joints degrade over time. I have to say, invariably, my, my answer to that is usually I'm being asked to come back and treat it again because it did a really nice job and then it starts to wear off or the disease gets a bit worse again and they want me yeah. to come back and make it go better again. Yeah. So um, That's, that's yeah. the simple it's answer. Sort of a self, simple self-fulfilling prophecy. Yeah. Uh, right, Dr. Chris, yes. my friend read on Facebook about yeah. a friend's horse that got laminitis after it had steroid injections. Does yeah. that mean my horse will? Yeah. So um, whenever we are injecting a joint as veterinarians, we always have the potential of complications. Um, everything that you do in medicine has the potential of complications. No, um, there's no such thing as complications. We're not. Everything has to be fine and rosy. Com complications are real. We do everything that we can in our power to minimize those complications. So steroids in horses that are prone to laminitis um, have the potential of triggering a laminitic episode. And that's steroids in any fashion, whether it be inhaled steroids, injectable in the muscle, in the vein, 
or into the joint, any type of steroid. Now, in terms of the evidence to show that it's associated with the induction of laminitic episodes, the evidence shows that in horses that are prone to having a laminitic episode, and those horses are the horses that are metabolically unstable. For example, they are metabolically Cushingoid or metabolic or have equine metabolic syndrome. In those horses, if we use a dose of steroid that is too large for that horse to cope with, then we can potentially induce a laminitic episode. So steroids plus horses that are already at risk factor for laminitis as in their metabolically unstable has the potential of triggering a laminitic episode if we don't use an appropriate dose of steroids. Good answer. I was being a bit facetious at the beginning, but it is always a good question. It's a great and question. It is a good question. And I actually love question. it when I love it when my clients question me. It's quite fun. No, it, but it's it's, it's thing, real. You know, it, there's no there's no such thing as a silly question, you know, and, no, it, and, and, it, and it, it does sadly occasionally happen. But in a, a veterinary client relationship that can identify potential risk factors, we can either modify the doses of our steroids or we can use alternates to steroids. Still, the cornerstone of my practice is steroids inside joints, but there are nice alternates which are particularly suitable for those horses that are at risk of inducing a laminitic episode. Yeah, I've seen, I, I mean, I've had cases of it. Um, I'll be the same as you, Chris. It's the cornerstone of what I do. But sadly, you do see the cases and you still get the odd one. You do get the rare one that surprises you. I, yeah. I sadly lost a, a really lovely event horse. Um, at one point and that and, that, and uh, yeah and that was fit and it was in work and yep. Yep. um the only thing i could put it to was and it is something and then this is a personal thing listeners but i um i'm quite wary of having horses shod on the day i medicate their joints i just sometimes i have a couple of cases <laughs> i've seen of it is sometimes when either there's been a little you know the feet can get a bit you know some horses get a little bit palsy after they've had been shod particularly if they're hot shod um and i think the two two of the less than five cases i've seen of laminitis post joint injections i think have been related related to and it's in no way the farrier's fault they've not done anything wrong it's just a couple of risk factors happening at the same yeah. time has I, just um, into a problem I, um, I try and i try and give a couple of days either side yeah no, don't, don't be don't be injecting joints within a couple of days of the farrier being coming or don't inject you know before or after you know I try yeah. I definitely do that as well is that my thing, my standard you? my standard setup as well yeah um okay cool well I mean and and then the other risk factor and it's probably equivalent to all joint injections is infection uh, sepsis you, yeah so right Absolutely. Uh, so everyone you'll see the vets will do uh lots of scrubbing uh some will clip the hair off although that is a little bit controversial you know there's actually not to my knowledge chris you're the you're the absolute expert on published papers but there's not any sort of d definitive evidence to say that that clipping reduces the risk unless you've got a horse that's particularly hairy and some yeah. do have particularly hairy legs at this time of year Cli uh, clipping clipping has been shown to not decrease the risk it, there, there is no change. Again, controversially, there was one paper to say that it may even increase the risk. But uh, the the best summary is to say that clipping or not clipping, it is the same potential risk for sepsis. Um, there's also uh, some nice evidence out there in the papers that say that our potential uh, risk for a joint infection is no different whether it's done inside a hospital or on the road, ambulatory. Um, there's no difference whether it's done by a, a hospital clinician or an ambulatory clinician. Um, both you and I live our lives on the road, but we've also spent times in the hospital. Um, I, I do have a couple of uh, setups where um, we walk the horse from one barn to a different barn, just a little bit down the road because it's just a, a more clean setup. Um, but there's no difference in terms of our risk factors for joint infection and um, cleanliness, sterile prep, scrubbing, you know, for, for owners and riders and clients, um, watch the veterinarian when they're drawing up all these things. You'll see that we are amazingly particular, even on like the, the very, we, the very particular way we open our syringes and our needles and the, 
perfect way we put our gloves on, like being like really cautious. And I certainly have interns that ride around with me and they're always commenting how many times I'm changing my gloves because gloves are cheap and I, I, I'm more than happy to scrub a bit and change some gloves and be super clean. You won't have any of this in Florida, but there's a thing over here at the moment called mud. Yeah. And there is nothing more annoying yeah. to a vet arriving to do some medications and to find mud plastered all over legs yeah i know have, so we have, uh there we, we are dust. guys yeah you have dust instead we have dust. Do you? yeah we have we have mud we have dust and, and, we have and, dust and wind Ugh, oh. wind and all of a sudden like something blows past your your nice <laughs> sterile field yeah. and then you lose oh yeah like, that is annoying the wind is wind. annoying as well you're right wind. that is quite annoying but yes, cleanliness, it is a potential risk. Um, laminitis, it is a potential risk. It's important to understand that these are very, 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 very unlikely, but not impossible. And in the hands of a conscientious veterinarian, something that we keep in our mind and we do everything we can to minimize even further. Right. Let's move on to some of the cool things that we can now put in horses' joints. So yes. Let's, so cortisone is, the, is, guys, is the cornerstone because... We like it because it is cheap. And it works. Is, it's cheap and it works and it's very effective at reducing pain and inflammation. So yes. therefore we like that. Yeah. But there are other things that can do it too. And I wanted to just split these, even these into two different categories. So we can have, um, so these come under the heading of what we call biologics. That's the term that we as vets call them. So this is where we generally, <laughs> generally, apart from the exceptions, taking blood from the horse and then doing something to it. And then what we get at the end of it, we're putting into the joint. And we can actually split these into two different areas where we can have the anti-inflammatory ones. Um, so we're looking at trying to do the similar job to what the, what cortisone is doing. Uh, and then also we've got ones that are sort of even more disease modifying. So sort of more, more for sort of healing um, and rehabilitationary as well. So, um, do you want to crack on, Chris, with a couple of the anti-inflammatory ones? Um, yeah, so, so in terms of our biologic IRAP, uh, an oldie but a goodie, something that's been around since we were in veterinary school, still something that I use a lot. Um, so IRAP stands for interleukin-1 receptor antagonist protein. So basically all of these blood-derived uh, products are trying to concentrate the body's own natural anti-inflammatories and its own natural growth promotants and their own natural biologic healing mechanisms. So IRAP um, is an oldie but a goodie. Um, it's probably in terms of its fancy concept autologous conditioned serum. So um, the blood, the serum in the blood, we pull it from the horse and then we process it the difference about IRAP compared to what most of the other biologics that are a little bit newer is that we incubate it overnight. We pull it in a fancy syringe which has these little beads in it, and they that and then we grow then we heat it up and incubate it overnight, and we really grow the goodness that's in the um, in the blood already, try to multiply it, and then we concentrate it down, and then we put it back into the horse, and so. The downsides of IRAP is that you've got to have that ability to sterilely incubate it and process it, and it's not an instant gratification process. It's a pull the blood, take the ho take the blood away from the horse, process it at your facility, bring it back to the horse, inject it. But the good thing about it is that it is um, you get quite a large volume, and so that means that you could potentially do um, a couple of joints or several joints in one go, um, or have multiple doses over a period of time because the cool thing about these biologics is that once we've pulled it and we've processed it and it's sterile we can freeze it and then um and then we can use it later and actually some of these biologics are even better when they're frozen we've been shown that that when you freeze the biologic it actually releases some of, more of the goodness mm. so Do you use IRAP I, I don't i use a different version of irap so yep. irap is as chris has talked about their focuses on one particular anti-inflammatory protein. I, I do uh, my version of the autologous condition serum is a is a product called ProStride. Yeah. Uh, so similar thing. We take pull the blood, we stick it in a in a centrifuge, so we spin it, do it a couple of times, 
So first thing we do is we make another product called PRP, which we'll talk about, platelet-rich plasma, and then we then transfer that into another little uh, plastic well, and then that's got some beads in as well, and then you give that another spin, and then you end up with um, a little bit more of a soup of anti-inflammatories rather than just the one that IRAP focuses on, which I quite like because I think sometimes we can just be over-focused on one particular protein that we might have focused our you know interest on. Uh, and also it's quite handy because I don't have to incubate it for 24 hours. I can do it yeah. there, stable side. Uh, I can make it up and I can use it and treat it. Um, yeah. I suppose so, the downside of ProStride is you only end up with about three to four small, mil. Yeah. Per so Pro, ProStride is the, Pro is the brand name, but basically your first process is you make platelet-rich plasma and then you concentrate it down and essentially you you get the best of ProStride. The ProStride is almost like the best of PRP with – a lot of what's really great about IRAP. Um, and the cool thing about um, IRAP is it's got excellent studies and excellent science. Even more cool about ProStride is it's got great science and great studies, which shows that you don't need to take it back to the hospital. You can just do it stall site, um, which is really helpful for you know an ambulatory practitioner and then owners and riders that aren't you know, localised near... Um, you know, near big facilities. Um, it's got, you know, good evidence, nice published papers to to show ProStride does have efficacy. It has lots of different types of um, growth promoting um, growth factors, anti-inflammatory proteins in there. It's, um, it's a really nice uh, product and um, it's certainly something that um, I put some ProStride in a horse yesterday. Um, it's, a, it's a nice thing. Good product. It is more expensive than cortisone. I think we said yeah. one of the advantages of cortisone is the cost. It is probably 10 times more expensive per vial um, of what you're doing. But, uh, and that might vary, but it is a good product. It has the advantage that it is not cortisone. So you don't have to worry about the laminitis concern. So you yeah. don't have that yet. You're still getting the nice anti-inflammatory effect. Tell me, Chris, you, you would be the ex expert on it, but whether it's considered equal in its efficacy of anti-inflammatory versus cortisone oh, probably not no. yeah probably not but i think, uh, I think in terms of good. but, but the thing is is that um you can use too much steroids yeah yeah you yeah, can't yeah. use too much biologics and yeah. um potentially each and every time you are using your biologic you're maybe creating a inverted commas slightly more healthy joint yeah. maybe um, you're certainly putting growth factors in there. You're certainly trying, you're certainly putting things that in a Petri dish have been shown to be more anabolic as opposed to catabolic. So building as opposed to breakdown products. And so maybe when you're using it um, over a period of time, you might be having more of a disease modifying effect um, and potentially more slowing of the progression of the disease cool yeah good product i enjoy it. yeah. I mean, it's great that as an ambulatory vet that it's something that we can do out on the yes. road yes similar um, to prp similar to prp which we yeah. will get on to uh we've got one more anti-inflammatory biologic that i think we should talk about that's that's become definitely in the uk more prevalent in the last couple of years uh, i think it's probably been in america a little bit longer um but that's a product called alpha 2 eq um, are you using a lot of Alpha 2 over in, in Wellington, Chris? So me personally, no. Uh, American vets, yes, 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 yes. And what's the principle behind this product? So I think it's good to take a small little step back and say that all of these inflammatory proteins and all of these markers and all of these growth promotants are present in all horses' bloods. And the way you process them to try and increase one over the other is what sets the different products apart. However, there is currently no direct comparison between one product and the next product and the next product and the next product to truly say, well, this product's way better than this one in terms of these markers. No, one, no one's ever done that study, and I don't think anyone's going to ever be able to do that study because it's just almost impossible. You're comparing apple, apples with oranges, with pineapples, with tomatoes. 
they're different and they're approaching the joint uh, health in a different way. Then also another thing just to put a slight caveat on all this to confuse everyone is that when you are trying to bring a product to market, you have to try and prove what you can prove and you have to go out there and prove to the licensing bodies that this product does this. Now, it's impossible to to go out and prove that it does 15 different things. So what you'll do is you'll go and prove that it does something slightly different than everyone else's. So there is IRAP inside ProStride. There are, there are the growth factors in ProStride inside IRAP. There's Alpha 2 inside ProStride. The, all of these different factors are in all of the different products. They just potentially have slightly different proportions. Um, and so that's my little caveat to say that um, none of them have been proven to be better than anyone else's. Yeah, they all have yeah. their pros and cons. Yeah. This particular product that Spike is talking about, Alpha 2 Maclagoblin, this is a, a cool little protein that these guys essentially discovered that can bind on to what we call proteases and MMPs, metalloproteinases, and then they're the little bad guys running around inside your joint chewing up all the goodness. And so what they can do is essentially capture them and get rid of them and bind them up and stop them from doing badness inside the joint. Um, Alpha-2 inhibits that cartilage degradation. Um, and in terms of the pros and cons of it, Alpha-2 gives you a large volume for what you get. So Spike spoke about the... Um, the pro strike giving you a smaller volume of something, this gives you a much larger volume and that can have its efficacy because then you can have one spin of this blood and get a large volume of something to then use it potentially either many times um, because you're freezing it or using it in multiple sites with requirements for larger volumes. Um, yeah. So my I, past- I've, been, uh, I've been pleased with it. Chris, yeah, in my yeah. Oh, no, um, it, in our practice, it's one of the, the most popular choices. Um, it's, um, yeah, it's a good product. I suppose what I would say, we're talking about, you know, big picture here, guys, just comparing it to different things. I think it's, uh, it definitely doesn't quite act like the switch that cortisone often is, you know, that you put the cortisone in the joint and it's, it, you know, the anti-inflammatory is cracked on and kicked on very quickly. I think there's a little bit more of a delay in my experience. It can take, and feedback from riders, it can take sort of a week, if not two weeks, to really see um, an improvement. But that's fine. You know, that's not a problem. And I've actually had some nice effects using it. I know we're talking about joint injections here, but I've been using it treating uh, back pain as well. Absolutely. The and biologics had a, had a really. In- had a really really nice effects from that so by Bi- biologics in that ax- axial skeleton within that neck within that back and within that sacroiliac definitely it's a place yeah. to be that we could be utilizing them um and so alpha 2 gives you a large volume because sometimes we have to use large volumes in large bits of the body yeah. in terms of the back and the si so yeah there we are guys there's some these are some of these new cool products there's the people out there always trying to do that you know researching this on an absolutely I mean, less than microscopic on an absolutely cellular level about working out what proteins, what anti-inflammatory things we're using. Um, so there's always new products coming out. Um, so yeah, when when you're talking to your vet about joint injections, they, they'll have a plenty in their armory from that point of view. Uh, so there, there's a few anti-inflammatories. There's the final sort of biologic I was going to talk about, and we've already touched on it, is PRP, where the principle there, which is platelet-rich plasma, is probably more using it for the sort of healing and growth factor side of it rather than a more of a specific anti-inflammatory it does have an anti-inflammatory effect there's no doubt about that we know that um but personally i would be using that in in joints where i'm then giving the period of time of rest and rehabilitation for the horse to try and heal a problem whether that be um a ligament that's attaching into the joint whether that be because of the joint capsule having a problem uh, and, and those sort of things um so that's another option prp will be used quite well quite commonly in tendon injuries and other ligament injuries in into lesions um but you can put it into joints because again if there's a cavity there that you can inject into um stifles for example there's quite a lot of soft tissue injuries and stifles and it can be quite effective there so uh, prp platelet rich plasma is another tool in our armory of take some blood and spin it and see what you've got um yeah 
It's something um, that I use inside joints as well. So I think that's good. Using stem cells inside joints, Spike. Uh, I am not personally, um, but that is something we we're going to go on to. That is an option. The product over here is called Articell. For vets to handle, it's quite, you know, the, because it's got to come frozen. It's a, it's a stem cell derived product. It's been from stem cells of another horse, which is pretty cool science isn't it you know that you're taking stem cells from another horse and you're doing something to it that what they're doing is that they're, they're sort of persuading these stem cells to go become cartilage or influence cartilage or do something to the cartilage rather than just do something else um yeah. and then they're free they're freezing them and then we're then putting them into joints um yeah. and, there, and and there's some there's some nice papers and some nice nice evidence that it yeah does i think do something I think the caveat on all things stem cells, um, having put some in joints and having done a whole study in my residency about putting them inside tendons, is that um, stem cells aren't magic. They don't just magically grow into brand new things. You can't just magically put them inside a joint and assume that you're going to grow a new joint. Um, They are potent anti-inflammatories. They're what we nerds call chemotactic they are self-signaling as in they tell the rest of the body hey dudes this is an area of badness come and heal it so they bring healing to an area but they don't magically just grow back things it's funny isn't it we would always imagine stem cells you know putting yeah. stem cells into something they are going to then be the what turn yeah. into what we want them to be we wish but actually, it was yeah we know that that's not the case um no, you know even in the so. even in tendons uh, we yeah. know that they, stem stem cells have their place um and we're learning more and more about them but they are not magic none of none of these biologics are magic no no joint injection is magic it all takes time and, and rehab um but yeah the stem cells are an interesting one um, that Artie Cell product is trying to get licensed here in the US, hasn't quite reached us here yet, came out of Germany and then the United Kingdom and then trying to get licensed here at the moment. My final product I was going to talk about, and, and I think it's licensed over there with you guys as well, uh, is a product called Arthromid. That's the trade name over here, but that's uh, what it is. It's called polyacrylamide gel. So basically it's a sort of a liquid plastic that became licensed, I think we'd say in the last five years, um, for injecting into joints and the effect that that can have. Um, do you want to, you, you're very good with the science, Chris. Do you want to explain what the theory is behind using the, the gel? Yeah. So, Arthromid brand name, uh, another brand name is Noltrex. Another brand name that's popped up here in the US is called Sprung. Um, so, a polyacrylamide gel, essentially, think of it as almost like a plastic filler. Um, it is. Came from our, the filler. Came it from our cosmetic. Our yeah. cosmetic uh, medicine friends. Um, so out of my crow's th- feet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so the thought process is is that this um, polyacrylamide gel goes inside the joint and it coats um, either the surface of the cartilage or the surface of the synovial lining, and then in that process, dulls down that inflammatory uh, synovitis, those inflammatory processes reverses some of the the damage that's happening inside the soft tissue with inside the joints and then potentially is then coating some of the areas where we're seeing cartilage fibrillation or fraying of the cartilage unevenness to try and make it more of a smoother thing i know here um it's advertised uh in the human world as you know putting a shock absorber back into your knees or or putting a lining back into your knees it's not quite like that we wish it was um but these are polyacrylamide gels are certainly um things that have their place they're awfully simple to use because they're they, they're just inside a syringe, inside a box that sits inside um, the vet clinic or the vet truck and then injected into the joint as an alternate to steroids and an alternate to the biologic-derived joint injections. Yeah. I th- I'm, I'm sure listeners, you people have heard of it. It's pretty popular at the moment. Um People reporting nice results um, into various joints. Um, I kind of go back to the published data on it. You know, the, the initial paper was in 
significantly arthritic joints in end stage fetlocks. joints, knees and fetlocks. Yeah, knees and fetlocks, end stage joints, and they showed a de- reduction in the lameness score, not an absence of lameness, but a significant reduction in the lameness score. So we know that it has a it must be pain modifying. And the belief also from the studies is that it is disease modifying in that they can make the sun ovium look happier. Um, and hopefully make it a little bit more elastic. I personally use it in, unfortunately, there are horses with quite bad arthritis in joints, particularly ones where that range of motion is reduced. So, for example, in fetlocks or knees, um, and have seen an improvement in range of motion in those joints afterwards, where I think it probably has helped the joint motion uh, equally. It goes hand in hand with some targeted physiotherapy, maybe some water treadmill exercise, and all the other things that go hand in hand. So how do we know which bit's most effective? But I definitely feel as though it has, it has a, definitely has a place. So, cool. That's a lot. There's a lot of cool things we can put in joints, isn't there? Um, yeah, how, it which, sure is. Which ones do we put in? <laughs> yeah, exactly. There's, there's, there's no right or wrong way. Each individual horse has to be assessed on an individual level. And then also the owner's in, and rider's individual risk assessment, budgets, veterinarians preferences veterinarians access to products um all of those come into the decision making process in terms of what you actually inject inside the joint um yeah yeah i think the other thing that we haven't even quite touched on is things like um medication withdrawals so one of the oh know, yeah the things that really important you know, really important to be aware uh, anyone here with horses that are competing you always want to know what's going in your horse and how long yeah. you know what that medication withdrawal is so and again with the biologics there isn't any because you're not putting no. anything in there that's testable albeit you probably have the horse sedated to do the job yeah. uh, so that will have a have a withdrawal um something that we're probably more aware of over here i know you compete under fei regs in america as well but we were guys we were Chris and I were talking off air before we started, but, you know, the regulations in America are very different to what we're used to over here, aren't they? Yeah. So FEI is is one one rule everywhere. Um, just a quick reminder that you have to be drug-free at the horse inspection, um, not when you compete at the horse inspection, drug-free. I tell you what, you, you come compete here in Wellington, you're getting drug tested out of the trot up. Happens. Um, but in terms of United States Equestrian Federation rules, the medication rules here are very much more permissive than what um, most of the world is. Um, so, for example, you're allowed to compete on phenylbutazone. Um, you can give uh, but 12 hours before you compete. You can compete on a large different variety of anti-inflammatory medications and then a, a variety of other types of, of drugs with different types of much shorter withdrawal times than, than what we would be used to in the FEI world. Um, and, yeah, so it's a, it's, a, it's a brave new world. Well, it's not brave. It, it's not new. It's just a very different world here in the United States in terms of competing national uh, rules where the drug rules are very permissive. Mm. And I think that what I wanted to just sort of probably end on is just maybe a little bit of a discussion between the two of us about probably sort of different cultural approaches to to joint injections. Um, yeah. I mean, I, as much as I pretend I'm old, but I'm, you know, whatever how long I've been doing this as a veterinary now would be what I qualified years. in 2006. So maybe not quite 20 years. 18. Um, 18. And That's it, pretty solid. And, it, and it's definitely evolved, you know. And I think, Very much you know, so. You know, 10 or 15, maybe 15 years ago, the concept of, let's say doing some routine hock medications seemed relatively alien to a lot of a lot of yeah. people who were sort of uh, who had horses and sometimes to be fair often having the discussion with owners who might be a generation different from the riders as well mm-hmm. um so to where we are now where i think we've already discussed that sort of injury prevention prehabilitation managing mm-hmm. low-grade problems to try and prevent more serious problems but um Chris, why don't you, I mean, it's different. It's different in, you know, in America with, you know, they have a, as you say, a bit, they may be just a little bit more interventionary with their medications than, than yeah. we would be over here. I, I think, I think in terms of my understanding of, of the veterinary culture here in relation to uh, joint injections and medication in general can be reflected a little bit in the wider human culture in terms of approach to medicine. Um, So, for example, 
television advertisements advertising prescription only medications, radio advertisements that are advertising prescription only medications. You know, you have this product, you need Resolvin, it's going to fix your mild to moderate, blah, 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 whatever it is. Like you, that's illegal in almost every other country in the entire world to be advertising medicines direct to consumers. Um, the veterinary market here, completely, totally fine to advertise prescription-only medications direct to consumers, um, online pharmacies direct to consumers, um, veterinary pharmacies that are at the horse show, giant semi-trailers of veterinary pharmacies with in-house vets who are prescribing medication directly to clients. So the access, the ready access to medication in humans as well as horses is a very different culture than um, than that is in Europe, Australia and the United Kingdom, Ireland, New Zealand. It's, it's a different concept towards healthcare. Um, healthcare personally here is a very expensive concept and you know you get inverted commas better healthcare if you pay more money. You know, there isn't a, an NHS, there isn't um, Medicare in Australia, you know, that public health care system. So the concept towards spending money and being um, and doing a lot of medicine for humans is normal. And so then that um, is similar in terms of our equine athletes. And so the concept of multiple joint injections at the same time or multiple uh, injections at, fr- at, at much shorter frequency um, it is a very different concept here in America than it is in the United Kingdom and Europe. Um, not that one is right or wrong. It is just yeah, different. Yeah, definitely. I mean, yeah, um, listeners, we're not trying it, to say that right, we're right no, or wrong, but I think it's just interesting to, to discuss yeah. the differences between different countries. Very different. Yeah. Very, yeah. very, very different. And so, yeah, just different concepts, different approaches, different uh, veterinary cultures as well in terms of the way uh, veterinarians earn their money, the way they ha- um, make their income, um, and also uh, the debt that's associated with going to university here in the United States. You know, it's not uncommon that my baby veterinarians that are working for me have two hundred thousand dollars worth of debt that they need to pay off just from going to veterinary school. It's a very different world than than the veterinary system that I went through and very different world than the veterinary system that, that is present in the United Kingdom and in Europe where, you know, if you're talented enough and you get selected, you probably get veterinary school for free. Mm, I wouldn't say that is quite the case now. I think there's still still significant debts coming out. But I think, you know, it's, it's tough talking about money, isn't it? Like vets don't yeah. like talking about money. Yeah. Um, the thing does things do have a cost and um, yeah. and you know and you know these young people who spent five six years at university in America often more because it's a postgraduate degree you know there's 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 a lot of sh- a lot of stress on these guys coming out with the with the loans Huge. that they've got in place but um, yeah. but yeah I think it is interesting isn't it you know that sort of a you know that sort of you know maybe a little bit more interventionary approach as, as I say we do you know we treat plenty of joints in this country and that and i think that approach at a higher level sport is definitely there and that's the case but equally i don't want listeners thinking that every horse needs to have their joints injected some of the sound no. lifestyle no. horses i've ever known never got touched you know yeah and, and, you know so uh, you know it, every horse is different but i think it's, yeah. it still doesn't step away from that concept of knowing horses well yes and, and sometimes at them regularly and, yeah. and sometimes uh, yeah. rest is all they need. Yeah. Sometimes they need an off season. Um, and sometimes they need diagnostics to know exactly what part of that joint we're, we're really trying to help. An interesting example I have, it's, it's in racing. But um, back when I worked in Australia, we had a, a big racing ownership group. And they um, the culture between uh, Sydney racing and Melbourne racing in terms of veterinary um, at times is different. And um, he compared his veterinary bills. Um, he had similar veterinary bills between Sydney and Melbourne. Um, I was working in Sydney. Um, he had similar race results in terms of his wins per run and his income, um, but his veterinary bill was cheaper in Sydney and had the majority of his veterinary bill um, in diagnostics as opposed to treatments, whereas down in Melbourne he had a slightly higher bill um, on average and the vast majority of his his veterinary bill down there was um, treatments, not necessarily diagnostics. So 
I always have that in the back of my mind that the same results came from one attitude that was more diagnostic approach and one attitude that was more treatment approached. Mm, that's interesting. Yeah, no, really interesting. And uh, yeah, and I think that just completes the loop quite nicely, you know, going back and, you know, what we said at the beginning about getting as, as close to a, or getting as an accurate a diagnosis as possible means that you can be really targeted with your treatment. So, yeah. Chris, that's brilliant. We and you could just chat forever, but we've been going for more than an hour. Listeners, I hope it's been really valuable. There's been some geeky things in there, but also, um, yeah, I'm pleased to get stuck into a good veterinary topic. I hope that people find it useful. I hope it gives some perspective. Uh, get out on the social channels and ask questions. And yeah, ask questions of your of your own vets, of your guys that are, you know, like we love it. We like we like questions. We like to discuss these things. It's interesting stuff. And uh, and yeah, when it, when you start running into you know uh, you know running into problems with your horses hopefully you're you know a bit more awareness of the different options that are out there because there are lots and that means that we are hopefully as a as an industry in a position to try and help as many horses as possible to make sure that they can those horses can keep doing what they love doing and that's uh training and competing so um yeah chris thank you very much thank you for coming on we oh, thanks uh, for ha- thanks for having me it's, it's i hope really, you get your I hope you get your eventing fix and you're not stuck just having to look at show jumpers and dressage horses. No, I, I, I'm very lucky. I, I am again invited to work at uh, Defender uh, Kentucky Horse Trials, which is cool. Uh, it's a special place. Um, I, I get to base myself in Lexington for quite a bit of the summer. Um, but, yeah, working at Kentucky Horse Trials is is super cool. Um, well, well that makes me very jealous. It's still on my bucket list. I've still yeah, it's, a, it's magic. We we need to collect all we need to collect all the five stars, mate. Let's go to yeah, all of them. To, It'd be really we fun. Need to write that up. Um, we need to write that up. Yeah, and I, I'm just going to throw it out there. I don't know anyone who's going to listen to me, but I think we need a defender um, Grand Slam, a defender uh, Burley, a defender Kentucky, and then a defender Blair. Win all Ooh. those three in a row. Imagine that. Win That'd Blair. Win. That'd be some well, yeah, event we, horse that could do that'd that. Be some, that'd be one hell of an event horse. Win Blair, win Burley, win Kentucky. Now that is a Grand Slam I want to see. Well, there you go. There we go. So any prospective uh, listeners from Jaguar Land Rover, yeah. uh, please do speak to your bosses at high levels. Uh, yeah, let's make that happen. That'd be amazing. That'd be amazing. Yeah. And, and if they fancy if they fancy sponsoring the whole box, it could be the Defender whole box as well if they like it. The Defender. The Defender box. Hey, there's, <laughs> there's, little, there's little boxes on the side of their cool new Defender. Yeah, they are. They yeah. are cool. They yeah. are cool. The Defender box. Right. Chris, awesome job. Thank you ever so See much. You later, Listeners, hope you all enjoyed Pleasure. it. And uh, we'll be coming back to you soon with another episode of the Defender Whole Box. Hey, I'm Sarah Watley and I'm head girl for Alex Brown. My favourite car day master product is Medicaid Shampoo. We use it every day after walk to work. Get help to get all grease and grime out of the coat and any little stabs. Welcome to Quick Fire Questions with Fairfax and Favour, where we will be putting some quick fire questions, as the name might suggest, to some of the best riders in the business. And today's guest is the 2020 USEA Leading Rider of the Year. It is Liz Halliday Sharp. Liz, are you ready? I'm ready. What is your favourite meal? I think it would have to be a really nice steak dinner. What Fairfax and Favour item is your go to when you go out for dinner? I really love the Kensington. It's such a gorgeous short boot and you can wear it with, you know, jeans or nice trousers or, or even a dress. So I'd say that's my main go to. What is your secret weapon? Coffee. What B is your favourite? Bags, boots, or belts? Am I allowed to say all three? If it's from Absolutely. Fairfax and Favour, I actually do love all three. So. There we go. Liz Halliday Sharp, thank you very much for going under our quick fire questions with Fairfax and Favour. Thank you. It's been my pleasure.